hello students in today's video let us learn about albert einstein one of the greatest physicist of all time and his contribution to the field of physics we will specifically focus into the contribution of albert einstein in the field of relativity albert einstein is a german born physicist born in the year 1879 and he lived up to 1955 So later he migrated to USA, and he lived his first first part of his life in USA. So he was born in Germany, and his main research areas were relativity, photoelectric effect, and Brownian motion. The interesting part is that almost all the important innovations relating to these fields were made in the year nineteen not five by Albert Einstein when he was. just 26 years of age and that year is often called annus mirabilis or the year of miracles he is considered as one of the greatest persons physicist and scientist of all time and he was chosen as the person of the century 20th century by time magazine now uh, not like unlike thomas alva edison or Nikola Tesla who had made plenty of inventions the contribution by Albert Einstein is mainly in the theoretical field relating to concepts and ideas the idea set by Albert Einstein created a new pattern of thinking in the field of mechanics and he also greatly contributed to other different phenomena explaining the physics behind other phenomena such as photoelectric effect brownian motion and so on first let us understand the einstein's explanation on photoelectric effect so as i have mentioned this is one of the major contribution by albert einstein putting forward a quantum theory to explain the photoelectric effect in fact albert einstein received nobel prize in 1921 for the contribution to the field of photoelectric effect and also to different other theoretical physics fields now according to albert einstein and his proposed quantum theory the photoelectric effect can be explained if the photons or the electromagnetic waves are considered to be photons which are the quantum particles if a photon of h mu energy is falling onto a metal surface electrons will be emitted from this material and this effect is often called photoelectric effect so if h nu is the energy of the incident photon that energy will be given to this electron in order to get liberated from this material and we call that energy as the work function phi so work function is the energy required to let loose an electron from the material and the rest of rest of the energy supplied by the photon will be given as the kinetic energy of the moving electron so this is the famous equation proposed by albert einstein the energy of the incident photon is used up to liberate the electron which is the work function and the rest of the energy is provided as the kinetic energy of the moving electron now albert einstein also contributed greatly in explaining the phenomenon of brownian motion you might be you might have heard the term brownian motion this is the random zigzag motion of tiny particles suspended in still water some pollen grains and dust particles in air etc show brownian motion this kind of zigzag movement through the medium is often termed as brownian motion einstein tried to frame a set of theoretical equations in order to study this random motion so here you can see this random movement of this brownian particle through the media so as indicated in this figure a lot of brownian particles can move like this if you focus on one particular particle it might be choosing a very random path now albert einstein formulated a theory and he explained the motion of brownian particles in the first part of the theory he formulated a diffusion equation for brownian particles so 
do not worry about this equation. He just proposed an equation which actually could explain the diffusion process of Brownian particles. And through this equation, Einstein was able to form a relation between the diffusion coefficient d and the square of the displacement or the mean square displacement of a Brownian particle, particle x square bar. So, this is the equation. The diffusion coefficient is related to the mean squared displacement. And in the second part, Einstein actually related the diffusion coefficient d to some other measurable physical quantities like temperature or Avogadro number r etc. So, this contribution by Albert Einstein in formulating a theoretical framework to understand and analyze the Brownian motion was quite important. This is one of the most cited work of Albert Einstein in the field of Brownian motion. Now, the third and the most important contribution by Albert Einstein could be considered to be in the field of relativity. So, when we speak about relativity, there are two different theories or two correlated theories that are set by Albert Einstein. One is the special theory of relativity and the second one is the general theory of relativity. First, let us focus on the special theory of relativity. Now, special theory of relativity as proposed by Albert Einstein in 1905 showed how the measurement of time and spaces are affected by the motion between the observer and the thing which is being observed. So, the relative motion or the velocity will contribute to the concepts of time and space. This special theory of relativity can be applied to inertial frames. By inertial frames, we mean a frame which is not accelerating. So, the observer or the factors that are being considered in this setup, different frames that are used should not be accelerating if we have to apply special theory of relativity. Now, Einstein came to this theory by observing certain inconsistencies in the Newtonian mechanics. Usually, we analyze the motion of the objects using Newtonian mechanics or different other classical theories of mechanics. But Albert Einstein brought a new set of idea where he tried to apply the theories of relativity while understanding motion. The two postulates of the special theory of relativity are the first one, the laws of physics are invariant in all inertial frames of reference. So, as I have mentioned, the special theory of relativity is applicable only in inertial frames or known accelerating frames. And these known accelerating frames obey Newton's first law. And according to the first postulate, the laws of physics are invariant in all inertial frames. Now, according to the second postulate, the speed of light in a vacuum is same for all observers regardless of the motion of the light source or observed. So, even if we are moving towards the light source or away from the light source, the speed of the light is always a constant in a particular medium. So, in the free space, we have c to be the velocity of light and this is a constant regardless of the motion of the observer or that of the source. This is the second postulate of special theory of relativity. Now, there are plenty of consequences that arise from this special theory of relativity and let us go through that. First one is the length contraction. So, suppose an object is moving and it is having a length L along the direction of motion, then due to its motion, its length will get shorter compared to the actual length. So, suppose L0 is the actual length of this rocket at rest at zero velocity. Now, if it is attaining some velocity, suppose say 0.866 c 
or say 0 0.995 C, then its length is getting contracted. So as you can see, the equation for the re relation between the actual length and the length after the motion with velocity v is given by this equation. So here you can see the length is equal to the actual length when it is at rest L0 into root of 1 minus v square by c square where v is the velocity of the moving body c is the velocity of light. Now since v by c is a fraction 1 minus v square by c square will be lesser than 1 and this factor root of 1 minus v square by c square is a factor which is lesser than 1. So multiplying that with L0 will yield you a smaller number L. So surely you can see L is lesser than L0. What does that imply? When a body is moving, its length L will get reduced. L0 is the length which of the body when it is not moving and that length will be reduced to L when it is moving with velocity V. And when V increases, the length contraction will increase or the length will decrease further. Now another consequence of the special theory of relativity that is being observed is the time dilation. And the time interval on a clock in motion relative to an observer will appear to be increased. For example, if t dash is the time observed that on a frame that is moving with velocity v, then t dash is equal to t divided by root of 1 minus v square by c square where t is the rest time. And this implies that if a person is moving with velocity v, for him, time will appear dilated. And if if he has moved, uh, he has gone to some space for ten years at the speed of say zero point five c. From Earth, it might appear that he has gone for many years, but for that person, time will be dilated, and he will have spent much lesser time in space. So this is a very complicated concept to understand. Let us remind, remember that for a person who is moving with velocity v, time will appear dilated and the equation is given by t dash is equal to t divided by root of 1 minus v square by c square. So we know root of 1 minus v square by c square is a number lesser than 1. So t dash is equal to t divided by that number which is lesser than 1 will imply that t dash is greater than t. Earlier length was lesser than L0, now the time, the change time is actually greater than the rest time. That means time will be dilated for a person or, a, or for an object that is moving with velocity v. Length will contract, time will expand. This is the second consequence of special theory of relativity that I would like to mention. Now also we have the mass energy equivalence given by the famous equation E equal to mc square. Under this concept mass and energy are different manifestations of the same thing. So energy can be converted to mass and mass can be converted to energy and the equivalence between them is given by E equal to mc square which is the famous Einstein's equation. So the concept of energy being something that can be cannot be destroyed or mass as something that cannot be destroyed actually is actually shattered by this principle E equal to mc square mass can be converted to energy and energy can be converted to mass and vice versa. Now another consequence of the special theory of relativity is this concept of relativistic mass. So as we have mentioned, if a body is moving with velocity v, then the mass of this moving body will be equal to m0 which is the rest mass, the actual mass divided by root of 1 minus v square by c square. So the mass will increase if the body is moving. 
This equation is actually obtained from the mass energy equivalent m equal to e by c square or e equal to m c square. This will actually imply that when a body is moving with velocity v, the mass will change and the resultant mass will be the relativistic mass will be the rest mass divided by this factor gamma root of 1 minus v square by c square. So, what are the different changes for length? Length is contracted, it will be gamma times the L0 time t dash is t divided by gamma and mass m is m0 divided by gamma. So, these are the changes that we observe in physical parameters when the relativity is being considered when the object is moving, is moving with velocities comparable to that of light. Now, another consequence of this special theory of relativity is the relativity of simultaneous simultaneity. So, what is simultaneity? Simultaneity implies something that is happening at the same time. So, for example, look here, here we have two incidents A and B, two lightnings are falling at two different places and for an observer observing from here, these two events, these two lightnings happen at the same time. But somebody else is also observing these two events, two lightnings happening at place A and place B, he is moving very fast with velocity V. For him, these two events might not be simultaneous. He might feel that B was first, lightning struck at the place B first and the lightning at the A happened later. But for an, another person who is not moving, these two incidents are simultaneous. So, the, simul the concept of simultaneity is relative. This is actually a corollary of the time expansion or time dilation due to the relativity. And the equation for the simultaneity is given by t dash is equal to t minus v by c square x divided by root of 1 minus v square by c square. Here v is the velocity of the moving body, t dash is the apparent time observed by the observer and here x implies x is the spatial separation between the two events. So, you can conclude that the simultaneity is not, is not something that is defined, it can change depending on the velocity of the observer. Here you can see t dash and t actually implies the difference in time that is being observed. If the person is being is moving at velocity v, then that means that he might observe the same, he might observe the events that are happening simultaneously to be happening at different times. So, this is another consequence of special theory of relativity, Relate, simultaneity is also relative. Now, finally coming to the final contribution that I would like to mention about Albert Einstein relating to relativity, the general theory of relativity. We learned about special theory of relativity which applies to inertial frames or non-accelerating frames. Here the general theory of relativity applies to non-inertial frames or the frames which are accelerating. So, this is much more general that is why it is called general theory of relativity. Now, according to this theory, space and time are considered to be one continuum called space time. Usually, we have this concept that space is something separate and time is another quantity, but according to this general theory of relativity, space time is one continuum. We call it a four dimensional, four dimensional space which includes both space in three dimension and the time being the fourth dimension. Now, this theory could actually include the effects of acceleration as well. So, the forces of gravitation and its effect on the space can be studied under this general theory of relativity. Now, according to this theory, when massive objects are present in space, it actually crea creates 
curvatures in the space time continuum. So, as you can see here, if earth is situated here, we can consider it, consider the space time continuum around this earth and it will actually curve like this when due to the mass of the earth. And it is these curvatures that actually constitute the field of gravity according to the general theory of relativity. You know some object that is closer to earth might fall towards the earth due to the force of gravity, right? And according to the general theory of relativity, this force is actually due to this bend in space. It is actually falling through this curvature onto this, onto the massive body. So that is a new kind of concept that was put forward in the field of mechanics. This relativistic concept and the bending of space-time curvature, space-time. And one, one another part of this theory is the principle of equivalence and which states that an observer in a closed laboratory cannot distinguish between the effects produced by gravitational field and those produced by acceleration of the laboratory. The force due to gravitation and the force due to acceleration, these two are being equated in the principle of equivalence. So, suppose somebody is closed, closed in a box and he is under the effect of the gravitational force or sometimes he might be accelerating and he might be feeling that force a lot. This person inside the box cannot distinguish between this force due to gravity or this force due to acceleration. That is what is contained under the concept of principle of equivalence. Now this beautiful theory, special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity has a lot of experimental evidences and some of them are bending of light around massive bodies. Then the shift in the orbit of Mercury, gravitational redshift and gravitational waves. So as you can see here, a light coming from a star here is actually bent through the space time because the space time is bent. If a ball is rolling through a curved space, the ball will take the path of that curve, right? Similarly, the light that is passing through a massive object will have to bend through the space because the space itself is bent. So this effect is called, is, is it causes the bending of light around the massive bodies. And since photons have negligible mass, this could be accounted only through the considerations under the general theory of relativity. Now, in the second part, we said about the change in the orbit of Mercury. So, the perihelion of the Mercury actually presses around the Sun and this change in orbit could be explained only using the equations set forward by Albert Einstein in his theory of special theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity. So this, this phenomenon was observed earlier, this precession of the perihelion or the mo motion of this orbit of the mercury around the sun and this, or, this motion or this change in the path of mercury could be explained only using the general theory of relativity. Now the detection of gravitational waves was another important milestone. This was, ha this happened recently, the detection of, detection of gravitational waves at the famous laboratory LIGO. Now these gravitational waves are waves that are propagating through the space-time continuum and these waves were recently detected and these waves were theoretically proposed under the general theory of relativity. So as you can see here, you can imagine this gravitational waves to be something like this, waves that are propagating through the space-time. Now the gravitational redshift is another important experimental observation. The light that is emitted by different stars actually changes its frequency once it moves away from the star. So if, if the star is emitting a light of frequency nu, it will have an energy h nu. But in order to overcome the gravitational field or in order to get out from this well, it has to spend some energy. So it will lose some energy while it, while it moves through the space time 
and hence the frequency will decrease it will lose some energy and its frequency will decrease that is what happens in gravitational redshift so all these experimental observations actually underlined how correct the gravitational fields gravitational the general theory of relativity set by albert einstein is now finally we have learned about newtonian mechanics in our lower classes and the albert einstein's theory of relativity and his understanding about this concept about mechanics does not actually change anything related to newtonian mechanics New newtonian mechanics is correct within its own limits in fact the newton laws are an approximation of this general theory of relativity under small gravitational field so you can say that under weak gravitational forces this general theory of relativity will reduce to newtonian mechanics and even the general theory of relativity is only an approximate description of certain aspects of nature for example certain predictions that are made by the quantum mechanics could not be explained under this general theory of relativity so we can hope that there might be some kind of even general theories that could actually accommodate both quantum mechanics and the concepts under the general theory of relativity first of now we have gone through the concepts of relativity special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity we have tried to understand the different contributions by albert einstein in certain other fields such as the brownian motion and the photoelectric effect and we went through some aspects of special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity i hope that these concepts are clear for you we can remember albert einstein as one of the greatest scientist ever lived and one of the most beautiful brains of all time that walked on this earth thank you